Welcome to our new series, Rebuilding the Republic, Conversations about America's Future, here at the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. I'm Mark Koplick, Assistant Director. We'll be speaking throughout the spring with major thinkers about urgent issues facing the nation, including the threat of political insurrection, racist violence, and economic inequity. I'm joined today by two of America's leading academic experts on far right and white supremacist movements, Alexandra Minna Stern and Kas Muda. Alexandra Stern is a recognized authority on the history of eugenics and the author of Proud Boys and the White Ethno State, How the Alt-Right is Warping the American Imagination an examination of the alt-right's alarming success in selling fantasies of white supremacy. Kas Muda is, a, is an expert on far-right political movements around the globe and the author of The Far Right Today, a concise overview of far-right politics in the US, India, Brazil, and across the European continent. Elif Shafak, a recent guest in our series, called the book Powerful, Timely, Important, a much needed analysis. You can purchase books by our guests from an independent bookseller via a link on the screen. You can also find out more about the authors and their books here on this page. Alex and Kas, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So political terms like alt-right and populism have become a big part of our everyday conversation and our daily media experience, but, but these words are often used very loosely and imprecisely. What is the alt-right? Uh, let's first go to Alex. Well, I think of the 2010s as really the decade of the alt-right. The term itself emerged in the U.S. context in 2008 with a talk that was given by a so-called paleoconservative who really was questioning the alliance of the far right with the Republican party or different stripes of the Republican party in any way, shape or form, rejecting that and coming up with the idea alternative right, which is not that original, but he inserted it into the political discourse. And around 2008, 2009, Richard Spencer of the National Policy Institute that many of the viewers are probably familiar with, but has since kind of receded from the scene, he grabbed onto that term and hyphenated it into alt-right and began to, it began to infuse itself and, and find its legs really on social media and in this emergent umbrella network of groups that range from neo-Nazis, white supremacists, um, misog misogynists and men's rights groups to others on the libertarian side of things. So it really began um, to kind of gain traction by about the 2010s and really I would say entered the American political consciousness by 2015, 2016 and then in sync more and more people became aware of it in during the most the previous presidential election. Anything to add to that, Cass? Is, is the all right an important subcategory? Um, I personally do not use the term alt right because I find it a bit too vague. And I also have a problem with the fact that we kind of mainstream a term that has been used by the far right itself with a purpose. I mean, the term alt right was used and is used to kind of soften um, the stigma of terms like neo-fascism or the far right. Um, but I, the old right as a term, I think has some currency, particularly if you reference it in the way that like George Hawley has also done to refer particularly to more an online phenomenon and link it to the type of presentation, which is more kind of provocative and kind of edgy memes type of thing, but as an ideological um, a term to describe ideology, I personally prefer far right, extreme right and radical right. So, so to explore that a little more, uh, the, the alt right, uh, the self-described alt right tries to project a, a young, hip, 
and diverse image sometimes. Is that all about marketing or is it really mostly uh, just a bunch of angry old white guys or, or, or is it truly something new? Well, let me just say first that I agree with Cass in that, you know, the, the coining of the term was part of the strategy of mainstreaming and normalization. And so one of the things I like to do is always historicize the term. And I do think it gives us a window onto understanding the kind of convergences that came together around the 2010s and that really exploded then um, in the internet and on social media. I would say that the alt-right in general was part of this attempt at normalization, you know, bringing kind of normies into the cause, demonstrating that, you know, what is essentially neo-fascism could be, you know, kind of a hipster movement. That has had some success, but I would say things have become more complicated, especially in kind of the recent year or two with the anti-racist protests we've seen in the U.S. with the issues around kind of COVID and protests against COVID and, you know, leading into one of the comments I was going to make later, but I'll just make now is that, you know, the alt-right is really kind of fallen away to what is a, what I would call a militiaization, a more extreme militiaization of the, of, of the far right in the U.S. And, and around the globe. So I think it's a useful term, but I don't want to overstate it. And the fact that it's in my book is the artifact of publishing, you know, working with a publisher, you know, the term resonated at the time. But, you know, if I were to publish it again today, I would m most likely use far right or something else along those lines. And going to the, the youth aspect, and I, I think this has always been a bit of my problem with the application of the term alt-right. And so again, if I, if I refer to the book uh, of George Hawley, who's written a few books on the alt-right, he has on the one hand, these type of almost exclusively online phenomena. Um, and people are famous because of the memes that they make and, and whatever. But then he also has people who, um, like Jared Taylor, who's been around for forever, like, and he's older than me. Um, there's nothing particularly edgy about him. He's just an old school racist um, who just has been kind of reinvented by, um, by these kind of younger people who are a bit more tech savvy. But Jared Taylor and the American Renaissance has nothing 21st century about them. Like, I mean, it's, it's the 18th, 19th century, if anything. Um, and so, of course, young is always problematic, right? Because we're talking about the 2010s, we're 10 years further. Most of these people were already in their, in their late 20s, if not early 30s. They're, they're in their 40s now. Um, but I think another aspect is that what made the, the old right, in the sense, as an internet phenomenon so interesting, and particularly the media loved them, and gave disproportionate attention to them was well, it was new it was edgy but it normalizes right most of these memes we we now just take for granted we barely recognize them as old right um, of course twitter and others have also um like barred a lot of them um but the edginess is off and as a consequence i think the online phenomenon has kind of lost its attraction and its and its influence, but at the same time, a lot of it has become normalized. Most notably, of course, through younger parts of the Republican Party and the so-called conservative movement. I mean, I'm thinking about an organization like Turning Point USA, which is uh, like as mainstream on the one hand as one could be, but it's full of this type of alt-right meme um, memeology. I would say. Yeah, I, I'd like to uh, re return later to the idea of, of normalization and, and, and mainstreaming, but um, I wanted to ask about populism. It's, it's a term frequently invoked to explain the rise of Donald Trump. What's a useful definition of, of populism, Cost? Yeah, so it's still very popular to say that no one has a definition of populism and it's the most contested term ever. But actually, if you look at the immense amount of scholarship on populism that you see over the last decade in particular, you do see 
an increasing number of scholars who see populism first and foremost as a set of ideas. Now, whether that is a full-fledged ideology or whether that is a discourse, a narrative, is debate about it. Um, but I would say that the ideational approach, as it is called in, in academic terms, is dominant nowadays. Also, almost all of these definitions will see it ultimately as a division between the people and the elite in which the people are good and the elite are bad. Now, then there are details about whether it's an ideology, do people really believe it or do they use it, right? <clears throat> um, whether the distinction is purely moral, as I would argue, or whether it also has to do something with power and with money. Um, and so personally, I see populism as, an, as a thin-centered ideology which sees society as ultimately <clears throat> divided between two homogenous and juxtaposed um, groups, the pure people on the one end and the corrupt elite on the others, and that one politics to be an expression of the so-called volonté générale or general will. And so what is crucial here is monism and moralism. Monism, both the people and the elite are homogenous categories, which means that populists think that all the people share exactly the same interests and exactly the same values and are morally pure, whereas all the elites share the same interest and values and all are corrupt. And so this distinction is not about whether you have money. It's not necessarily whether you have power. It is whether you are pure morally or whether you're corrupt morally. So academia is almost always identified as part of this Im impure liberal elite. Uh, we're, we're all in academia. Um, Alex, are, are campuses as liberal as they say? And is there something about intellectual inquiry itself that leads people to embrace liberal political identities? Well, let me just start off by piggybacking on the discussion around populism and saying that as we know, populism can tilt left or tilt right. And one of the interesting phenomenon that I discovered in you know, researching the book and looking at who got on the Trump train, so to speak, around 2016, there were a good number of Bernie bros who jumped the ship from the one version of kind of economic kind of left populism to, you know, more racially moded right wing populism. And um, indeed, you know, in the US, there is a tendency to understand populism in more economic terms and to see, you know, recent political changes and shifts in terms of economic resentment. However, scholars have shown over and over again that it's often racial resentment that is more dominant or xenophobic resentment, anti-immigration resentment. I think what you're speaking to gets to much bigger questions around kind of the production of knowledge and epistemology and what counts as truth and what counts as fact. And, you know, we are living in a time of misinformation and conspiracy theories, which muddle all of these waters and also seeing as Cass was referring to as well, like, you know, these generational shifts and changes. I would say that overall, insofar as universities are a reflection of American society, nothing is really as liberal as it seems. Um, you know, and we have seen a corporatization of universities that might use liberal speak and even progressive talk while emulating aspects of more conservative institutions which then you know, enables those ideas to flourish. It's a, that's a big complex question that would require a lot more time to delve into. The one thing I would add though, is one of the reasons I wrote my book was because I was interested in the way in which um, particularly you know, far right leaders or white nationalist kind of figures in the US in the 2010s were themselves the products of Ivy League or prestigious institutions. They had master's degrees or PhDs and were emulating scholarly forms and modalities to again, engage in this type of normalization and to try to add a certain intellectual heft really along the European style into the right-wing thinking. Right, and if I might add to that, I mean, I teach in the Southeast at the University of Georgia, right? And so, um, 
first of all, and this is one of the things that I find very annoying about most of this conversation, which plays out in the New York Times among people who come from Ivy League schools or Northeastern schools, who are all the time pretty much going to the same old schools, like Grinnell, which is then not in the Northeast, and then Berkeley and Yale or something. But let's be realistic here. The vast, vast majority of people are educated at community colleges, at directional schools, and at big public schools. Most of these like, are centrist at best, if not more conservative. On top of that, even at schools like UGA, yes, I would think that the majority would consider themselves liberal. Now, whether they are actually that liberal is a second thing. But, and it's true that particularly within certain disciplines, like um, people are particularly left. But the business school, the law school, like the medical school, if you have them, are definitely, definitely not overly progressive and quite often very conservative. And let's face it, who is more important, critical literature or the business school in how a university is being run? So this is not just about numbers. Right? And I think that particularly at the top, increasingly universities, as Alex also says, like, first of all, it's a neoliberal model. Right? And, and so it bows to the pressures from quite often uh, very conservative state legislatures or relatively conservative donors. Um, and so this, this idea like that we have this, this crazy cultural Marxist elite that is dominating universities, it can only come from people who have not worked for the last 10 years, at least at the university, I think. So, so the, the far right often claims um, to be reacting to excesses of political correctness. Alex, you talk about the all right uh, trope of the, the SJW, the social justice warrior. Um, can political correctness be too extreme or should it in fact be more aggressive? Um, and I welcome thoughts from either of you on, on that. Well, I have to say that I like I would not frame the question that way because I don't think it's a particularly productive framing and it is somewhat dichotomous. Um, I would say again, what we need to do is look at the ideologies, the discursive and cultural fields, what is being discussed, what is being memified. And um, you know, I would say one of the, the, and then to historicize, like where does the term political correctness even come from? Who produced it? What work is it doing? And how is it standing in the way of more broad-based ideological or you know kind of intellectual dialogues? So I don't really I don't really want to go down that path. I mean, thank you for asking the question, but I think that instead it is really important to actually think about the threat that the far right poses today, um, both in terms of its the way it's been normalized how it has managed to um, insinuate its way into understandings of race and gender and a variety of other categories and has made terms like SJW or incel or these other terms, you know, part of the popular discourse, which was some of its aim in kind of moving this quote unquote Overton window as they like to call it, you know, more and more to the center. So, you know, I just don't find this political correctness back and forth to be that productive. We need to shift around the pieces and approach them from different angles to really kind of get at the, from my perspective, you know, the the intent, the magnitude of the situation we're dealing with. And again, if I can build off on that, it's important to see that terms like political correctness or even freedom of speech like, are part of the political discourse and of the political struggle. So like when I grew up in the 80s, 90s, freedom of speech was kind of a libertarian issue, if not a progressive issue. Freedom of speech has been completely hijacked by the far right and more broader re reactionary right. When we talk about freedom of speech now, we don't actually talk about the classic freedom of speech, which is about the state limiting your individual speech. We're now talking about your God-given right to have a column in the New York Times, which has nothing to do 
with freedom of speech, like in the classic way. And so by, by uncritically sticking with terms, like what we also mainstream like their influence. And that's not to say that like I personally think that there is at times too limited freedom of speech also at universities, but it's not exclusively a left-wing um, point. It is very much also comes from the right. You see this at the moment, how deep that goes, because in Britain, for example, the conservative government tr now tries to by and large legislate on the one hand, total freedom of speech, and on the other hand, almost tries to outlaw critique of the British Empire. And even French President Macron, for a long time, the hope of all liberals, right, is now um, wants an investigation into the teachings and the role of so-called Islamo-leftists um, at French universities. Um, and so I think, and this is, I think, in part because we have, we have kept the conversations going with our old terms, but those terms have been redefined in the meantime. We're um, it, all uh, American universities, certainly our universities are, are committed to, to eliminating um, hate speech on, on campus, which is, I understand, a, you know, a nebulous idea. At the same time, we're committed to open debate of ideas on their merits. Uh, what are the implications for us in a university community if one of the two major political parties is flirting with, with white nationalism? How, how will that affect ideas that we're willing to discuss, speakers that we're willing to welcome onto campus, that kind of thing? Well, if I can start on this one, I think this is, this is where most so-called liberals in US understanding and progressives, I think have just not caught up with how much has shifted. Like we, we assume that the vast majority of people support liberal democratic institutions and values. Whereas in practice, this is actually no longer the case. Like one of the parties is, is actively going against that and is broadly supported by its supporters in this sense. Now, again, my university, right, gets its money from an incredibly conservative Republican party, which dominates the Georgia legislature. They are terrified about discussions about slavery and about other issues because it would lead and could lead and to a certain extent has lead, led to even more anti-university sentiments. And that means cutting off money and those kind of things. And I think this is a reality that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do things, but I think that there are massive differences also within the country of what you can do and how you can do it, I think. Like a private university in the Northeast can be as liberal as they want to. They will actually get extra money for it, right? But a public in the South right, will actually pay the price for it. Again, that is in no way an excuse not to have these conversations or not to push the envelope. But I think it is important that we still assume right, that there is this consensus about what constitutes hate speech and um, what is the basic order that we're defending. And that consensus is no longer here. Alex? Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, I mean, if part of the role of universities is educating and training democratic and global citizens for the future, then we need to be able to, and I say this from the vantage point of someone in the humanities and the liberal arts, arm those students with the tools they need, they need to understand what democracy means where it came from and what some of its core values are. Because as I mentioned in my previous comments, those are under threat right now. Um, is citizenship, who is in and who is out is also something that needs to be interrogated. So I would say that, you know, our, the university can be quite fabulous in terms of tools of critical inquiry. And the question is, what are we focusing those tools on and what will be the most beneficial going forward? And we have in uh, Michigan, a, you know, a somewhat similar situation as in Georgia, I would say not quite so far 
I think your legislature is probably uh, more to the right than, and, and as you know well, very well in Michigan, we have a Democratic governor who herself was threatened by assassination and death by some of these militia groups. So we've had a lot of these dynamics playing out um, in my state. And I would say one thing that we all need to catch up with these terms is more and more critical digital literacy because so much of this happened online and is still playing out in the context of social media. And you know, social media is more than just a platform where content is exchanged. It's a place where people build community, uh, where they create networks, where identities are formed, recycled, reshuffled. And also there can be effective or emotional spaces where people feel a variety of sentiments from erotic to nostalgic. And so I think that really, I think digital literacy my personal feeling is that needs to be built into the liberal arts, especially as we move forward. And that in itself is connected to thinking about the terms of democracy and who, who, is, who is, has the most power in staking out those terms. It, it, it seems that there's um, an, an attraction among members of the far right to, to living in an alternative imaginative universe. Uh, Things like QAnon have become a part of almost normal political life. Um, why is that so attractive? And, and does the internet deserve the blame uh, for creating you know, a, a, a space um, for, for other alternative realities to thrive, a kind of virtual uh, reality, if you will? I'm sure Alex has uh, more to say about this, but I think it's important to remember in this that not everything starts with the internet and if you think about conspiracy theories right the 1970s one of the main uh, major activities of americans was to speculate about who killed jfk right? and conspiracy theories go back in this country and many other countries like decades and have always been part I mean, think about the conspiracy theories about communism that was so widespread in the 50s and 60s um, so I don't think they're new. That doesn't mean that the internet hasn't changed the way they play out. Um, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, you actually had to find the community physically, which was very difficult for many people and, and sometimes also kind of scary, right? You had to physically yourself go somewhere among people that you didn't know um, and they could see you, right? Now you do things on the internet. It takes you as, as long or short to communicate with someone in the Netherlands as in Canada. And you can do it anonymously if you want to. Um, and so it goes much easier and much faster. And I think that plays the key role. Like it's it just so easy to find a community that shares your core values. And then of course, it's very easy to limit your information increasingly to, to that specific community and create those kind of bubbles. Yeah, I would say that, you know, definitely, you know, in our social media echo chambers where people are reinforcing their likes and their links and their followers, you know, that is certainly the case. And, you know, in many ways, I mean, certainly conspiracy theories and, you know, the political far right predates the internet in many different ways and shapes and forms and, and decades. However, there are a few things that are important to consider in the context of social media. The first is that, you know, as study work has shown, you know, algorithms, um, especially until they have been more recently interrogated themselves were often highly racialized and highly gendered in ways that promoted, just to put it bluntly, white supremacy. There also have been serious issues with the uh, content moderation in terms of service. So for example, Facebook, for a long time, Mark Zuckerberg refused to take down anything related to Holocaust denial on his site. He switched his tune about six months ago, six months ago, even though you can still very much find that content on there. You can find it on Facebook, you can find it on Twitter, you can find it on the main, more mainstream platforms, and certainly on those that are kind of more the wild west of, of social media spaces. Um, in addition, you know, we do know that because of the way in which hyperlinking works, that the internet 
has been a vehicle to radicalization. And that, you know, those that might start off by looking at Jordan Peterson's transphobia or the deep platform Stefan Molyneux's ideas about race and IQ could end up later at American Renaissance or, you know, even embedded or connected to some of these uh, neo-Nazi groups. So I think that the radicalization factor is there. And finally, you know, it the internet has allowed these movements to become globalized in a new way. I would say there always has been an international component to them and a, you know, a transatlantic component as well, but there's a way in which the internet has a, really allowed um, particularly exchanges between you know, US and Europe in terms of globalizing the far right. Um, at, at UAlbany, we're, we're in the middle of uh, Sexuality Month. It's a conversation series we've had for decades here. Um, among other things, the series celebrates sexual diversity. You, you both talk about the militant hatred on the right for sexual diversity and their glorification of traditional gender identities. Can, can you both talk a bit more about that, why that's attractive to the right? I can start off with that. I mean, I would say one of the defining elements of kind of the neo-fascism of the contemporary far right, which has earlier resonances, is um, certainly it's uh, gender politics. It's focus on patriarchy and traditionalism and a fixation on gender dichotomies, essentialized gender dichotomies. One of the kind of interesting aspects of looking, let's say, just at the alt-right in the 2010s was the, it, the ambigu ambiguity, ambiguity, I can't pronounce that today, but the ambivalence, here, let's use another word, <laughs> the ambivalence that some of these far-right thinkers had when it came to gay identities. Some of the most prominent far-right thinkers have all but come out as gay themselves, and that's okay for some of them because the gender identity and the sexual orientation are one and the same. But when we move towards, and, and not everyone is down with that. I mean, many of these far right folks are very super homophobic, but as you move towards anything that disrupts essential biological categories of gender, particularly gender non-binariness or uh, transgender identities, that is where, that for me is always kind of a thermometer check to see where does this thinker or where does this group sit in the context of the right? They are incredibly transphobic. And, um, and that is sometimes where this radicalization will start. It will start with people who are uncomfortable with gender non-binariness. And then they will follow that along, you know, and end up in more far right quarters. So one of the points I really strove to make in my book is that the toxic gender politics that understanding the far right today absolutely requires close attention and recognition of its toxic gender politics, which are doing a lot of damage and harming people. And by the way, we're certainly amplified by the Trump administration. Now there's been some um, you know, turning back of that by the Biden administration, but those cultural, you know, those cultural dynamics are still very much with us. Yeah, my, my book has a global focus and I'm originally from the Netherlands. Um, and so I grew up um, in the north of Europe where with regard to both sexuality and gender, um, those norms are more progressive with all the problems that the society still have, right? But for example, in the Netherlands, uh, up to like 98% support, supports gay marriage. Right. And so one of the things that you see within because gender norms, even those of the far right, are always embedded in the national culture or subculture, which logically means that in societies that are generally more conservative, more religious, more macho, the far right will also be even more of that. Yet in societies that are very, let's say, progressive which are not even so much the Netherlands, but particularly Sweden or Norway, you will also see much more modest or centrist, if you want, um, gender roles and, and positions on sexuality of the far right. In fact, by American standards, the Dutch far right is insanely progressive on homosexuality. Um, but by Dutch standards, they are relatively conservative. 
Now, one of the things that we see within the North is two things that are called femonationalism and homonationalism. And in femonationalism, the issue of gender equality is used within the exclusive context of nativism. And so far right, many far right within Northern Europe accept gender equality. They kind of claim that it has been achieved and it's now only threatened by Islam and by Muslim immigrants. Similarly, a lot of these parties actually defend gay rights, truly defend. You will see a lot of, of rainbow flags at meetings of these type of groups, but only in the context of immigration and Islam. Whenever there is actually a law um, in parliament that will advance gender equality or gay rights outside of that nativist context, almost always these parties vote against under the pretext that we already have gender equality, so we don't need quota right? Or we already have gay rights, so they don't need to adopt kids, like things like that. But it is shifting, and it depends a lot on the broader culture. So even in France, which is more kind of transitionary and still divided strongly about sexuality and the gay rights issue, there's almost a split. So Marine Le Pen, the leader of what is now called the National Rally, has by and large embraced gay rights within this homonationalism. But interestingly, her younger niece, um, who is much more old school conservative and is more in the subculture of French conservatism and Catholicism, is vehemently opposed to them. So you do see a shift, but overall, first of all, I fully agree. You can only understand the contemporary far right through a gendered lens, because obviously it's a very gendered phenomenon, but it's also important that when we look at it, we don't focus only on the role of women. Like masculinity plays a crucial role to understanding why the far right is attractive to certain groups of people. So uh, Elif Shafak, the Turkish writer mentioned earlier, um, talks about the importance of feeling empathy and engaging with other people, even those uh, who have perfectly terrible political beliefs or beliefs opposed to one's own. How do you feel about this project, either of you? Um, okay, I, I don't feel uh, so optimistic. Uh, maybe it is because I've, I've been around far right people, but also far left people and other types of intolerant people for a long time. Um, and they don't shift because you talk to them and you're empathetic to them. Like now, that doesn't mean that you have to that you have to vilify them, right? But that endless accommodation of their feelings, while they don't shift in any way in their own feelings, right, is exactly the game that this whole white victimhood and male victimhood and to certain conservative victimhood is all about. Like at the moment, it's not enough anymore that people can be sexist or homophobic or racist, but they should also be shielded from critique over it, right? And, and that's just not how the world works, first of all. And also they are not, the, first of all, they're not actually the victims in most cases, but they're definitely not the only victims. Right? I mean, other people are also hurt. Homophobia hurts a lot of people and not only of the LGBTQ community, Right? but also their parents, for example, or their children or whatever it is. The same with sexism, that's 50% of the people, right? So I, I think that we have accommodated like the far right more than enough. Again, I personally, I shake the hand of far right politicians. Like I treat them as human beings because they are, right? I think those type of politics, which we have seen in Europe in the 80s, 90s is completely useless. Right? And, and we shouldn't vilify the individuals, particularly not those who are not violent, but we also shouldn't bend over backwards to make them feel comfortable because they don't do that either. And personally, I don't think that they deserve it. Alex? Yeah, I would agree that I think that, you know, the empathy card is, is I, I'm not that interested in playing the empathy card, not that I don't have empathy for people and their personal struggles and so on and so forth, but 
again, we're talking about um, upholding, you know, embracing and upholding certain ideas to potentially to the point of, you know, uh, political violence. And so that's one thing to always keep in mind. There are, in some instances, narratives of those, for example, Derek Black has wrote a book with Eli Saslow, I think his name is, which is about his journey out of Stormfront to, you know, kind of more mainstream liberal society and what that, how he had, to, how he was essentially deprogrammed through really social relationships and romantic relationships and also learning history. And so that can be a valuable book to understand his process and that narrative. At the same time, I think one of the things we definitely know by now is that facts just don't cut it. Like if you're pushing back against conspiracy theories, you know, piling up a hundred absolutely accurate facts to try to make your case is not going to, you know, have the effect you want. So this is where I think it's really important. You know, I have tended more and more, I wrote a book that's critical. A lot of my work has been critical about certain structures, ideas, and policies. However, we need to be forward looking about what is the type of country that we're headed towards and what do we actually want to create in terms of having a multiracial progressive democracy in the United States. So I tend to look forward and repeat that narrative, repeat the narrative in the future that you want. And it, I think that that is, um, I think that that's really, really important. So yeah, I don't, I think we need um, policy interventions around domestic extremism and terrorism in this country, speaking about the, the US. And, um, you know, empathy is, will only get us so far. So, so to build on, that, uh, for our last question, to build on that uh, forward looking uh, at an attitude that uh, Alex is, uh, is advocating for, um, you, you both talk about the importance of uh, us versus them mentalities in, in right wing movements. Uh, here on this uh, extremely diverse campus, you are also both on extremely diverse campuses. Um, our, our most important goal is to, is to foster uh, an idea of, of one big family, one big us. Is that an achievable goal? Let me first say that I'm not on a particularly <laughs> diverse campus, okay. sadly enough, but... Um, so I, so I believe in us, them, and, and in-group, out-group differentiation, as they often call it. And I think that pretty much you can't have a very strong us without a pretty strong them. Um, and so in that sense, this kind of in, including everyone thing, I'm not sure whether it will be that successful. I think rather than stressing, creating a new, very inclusive us identity, I think it's much more important to stress that we all have multiple identities and that they don't fully overlap, but they're cross-cutting, which means that you might have something in common with someone else who's also male or white or higher educated, right? Um, but you might also have something in common with, with a, a, a lower uh, educated woman of color because you both support the same soccer team or because you both are parents of a kid in a certain school. Um, I think what is important is rather than, than focus so much on how can we find the right identity and put everyone in it, uh, is actually stress that every identity is A, created and B, just part of your overall like being. And I think this is one of the problems that we have had. We have seen certain identities have been pushed incredibly hard and others have been underplayed. Um, and of course, this is in part like the, a classic uh, frustration of many on the left and particularly the more Marxist left is like ethnic or racial identity versus class identity. Like class has become a concept that is completely no longer used. Whereas in many ways for many of our political struggles and in many of our issues of solidarity, like class should be far more important than any type of ethnic or racial identity. Well, and that's where applying a feminist lens of intersectionality is really important going forward. Would you like to expand on that, Alex? 
Um, no, let's just do it. And along the lines of what Cass was laying out of finding points of human connection and, and moving forward. And I, you know, I, one of the, one of the points that I wanted to make in my book was to move away so much from the focusing on particular individuals and organizations in the far right or the alt right, because that's what so many of the journalists were fo doing good work, but that's what they were focusing on and really engaging with some of these ideologies and understanding the, the genealogies of these ideologies, where did they come from? What are they doing and what happens when they're mobilized? So I, I am all for critical inquiry of ideas around politics and government. And that is something that we, we all should be doing more of rather than, you know, there is really a tendency to let one thing stand in for a complex, a complexity, whether that's a particular person, whether that's a meme, you know, whether that's a stock phrase and so on. Yeah, and building off that, like, so take, for example, white supremacy, like, I mean, white supremacy, white supremacy within the U U.S. context in particular has, has always been closely linked to patriarchy, has been closely linked to Christianity, right? And so there are already three different identities coming together here. And, and um, on top of that, like, you, you don't, you don't overcome white supremacy by banning the Proud Boys or even like changing the Republican Party back to what was allegedly a non-far right party. Like white supremacy is deep inside of institutions, but also in the belief systems of many liberals. Right? And so by focusing on, on the most extreme form, right? and, and we see that with pictures as well, Right, which which infuriates me. Like whenever I see a picture of the insurrection, I see the QAnon shaman, but but the QAnon shaman is not the problem. Right, the problem is all the other people who look like your direct family, who are there as well. Right, but we always externalize the far right. We make it the the, the tattooed skinhead, like with the not the Nazi skinhead with a like a big swastika on his bald hat. Yeah, I mean, sure, that person can be a law and order threat, but your politics are not affected by that dude. Like, right? it's by Josh Hawley has been created, like, who has been trained at Stanford and Yale. Like, how is it possible that someone with all of that potential, like, actually becomes a voice for intolerance? That that is what we should focus on. And I'll just add to that that you know, again, let's not focus so much on Marjorie Taylor Greene but on the fact that her comments about Jewish laser beams, you know, coming down and causing COVID, that that actually resonated with millions of people and has emboldened her supporters. You know, we should be talking much more about how did that thinking even become possible and how was it being perpetuated? And less, not that she's not an issue and she shouldn't be sanctioned for whatever, she's done on the political scene, but nonetheless, the problem just goes so much deeper. And with that, I just like to say that, you know, this, it is incorrect at, in the US context to just connect the far right to Trump. It was there before Trump and it is going to be with us for quite some time. And it has become more paramilitarized in the past year or two. And that for me is one of the areas of gravest concern. The books, are the far right today and Proud Boys and the White Ethno State. You can purchase them from the Independent Bookhouse via a link on this screen. Alexandra Stern and Kas Muda, thanks so much for joining us. Thank Let you very much. Thank you. Let me remind you that this and all our author interviews are posted on the Writers Institute's YouTube channel and you can find them at the conversation on our website, nyswritersinstitute.com. Org. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you wish to support future programming like this, you can make a donation at our website. To our online audience, thanks so much for tuning in. Be well and be safe.